Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm absolutely thrilled uh, that you're all here um, for today's session or this evening session, which is applying to HDS at mid-career. Um, I'm so thrilled that everybody, uh, we're, we're joined today by a great group of folks, and I'm just so glad that um, that we're able to offer this event and hopefully provide a lot of information that will be helpful to you all in the audience. Um, so we will get started applying to HDS at mid-career. My name is Margaret Okada Shek. I'm the Associate Director of Admissions, and I am really excited to talk to you all um, a, a little bit about HDS. So the way this evening's event will go is that I will provide a short presentation, just a little bit about Harvard Divinity School, um, our degree programs, and some information we'd love for you all to know. And then I will turn it over to my colleagues um, to talk a little bit more about being um, a second, third, fourth, uh, fifth career student here at Harvard Divinity School. So uh, my presentation really is, is, is fun because this is really just five things we would love for you all to know about HDS. And absolutely the number one thing everybody should know is that Harvard Divinity School is the most religiously pluralistic divinity school in the world. That means that you are seeking an educational experience where your colleagues in the classroom may be like you, but may absolutely not be like you. And that really creates an incredible learning, a dynamic learning environment for folks. Um, we have more than 45 religious traditions represented in the student, organ in the student body you'd be able to participate in over 45 different types of student organizations. There are more than 60 student-led um, events every single year, which is in addition to the more than 500 yearly recurring worship services and social gathering workshops and, and other types of meetings. Really, students within and outside of the classroom are able to create a really diverse and dynamic learning community which is extraordinary. The second thing that I want everybody to know is that we have scholars here who make a world a difference and really care about the, the student body here at HDS. Um, you'll find that 67% of, uh, of our faculty are women of faculty and or faculty of color. 40% um, specialize in non-Christian traditions, really getting at the depth of world religions expertise, where we have strength in all five of the major religious traditions on our faculty. Uh, we have more than 85 research professors, visiting faculty, and other types of lectures offering instructions. And we also offer 12 denominational counselors for folks that are interested in ordained ministry or in um, and getting further information um, uh, around specific uh, traditions. Students are able to take um, over two, are uh, able to register at over 200 courses offered here in HDS that give a broad spectrum of interests, uh, across a broad spectrum of interests so that students can get both breadth and depth in knowledge in a variety of fields and religious traditions. Um, students, particularly in the Master Divinity program, have their choices over over 100 uh, field education sites. Um, and one of the best parts of HDS is the fact that over uh, students can cross register up to 50% of their classes outside of Harvard Divinity School. So you would be able to cross register at any one of the eight, uh, eight Harvard graduate programs like in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, in the Department of Sociology or History or Anthropology, um, but also at Harvard Business School, Harvard Law School, Harvard Kennedy School of Government, Harvard Graduate School of Education, um, or you can consider pursuing a dual degree with one of those institutions. And then in addition to that, HGS is a member of the Boston Theological Interreligious Consortium. It's a group of 10 institutions, uh, departments of religion in the Boston area. 
Um, Harvard University is located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is across uh, the Charles River from Boston. And it is such an incredibly dynamic place to pursue your graduate education because um, you not only get access to here, but you can take classes at B Boston University or Boston College. You can also take classes at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University or at MIT. Um, Harvard Divinity School offers four degrees and many, many pathways from that. Uh, we offer four different degree programs. Um, the Master of Theological Studies is our two-year degree program. It is full-time. Actually, all our programs are full-time and require residency here uh, in the area. Um, we do not offer online options. Um, and so the MTS is a two-year full-time time degree, we offer 19 areas of focus, depending on how you want to be situated in the field. Um, there is institutional grant aid for this program, as well as for our Master of Divinity program, which is our terminal professional degree here, a three-year full-time degree where folks who are called to ministry, um, such as uh, preaching or um, in a congregational setting or in a nonprofit or other types of ministry. Here at HDS, it's really broadly defined. We also offer institutional grant aid for that, um, that program. We also offer two one-year degree programs. The Master of Theology is for one year, and it's really it's a postgraduate degree for those who already have a Master of Divinity, as well as the Master of Religion in Public Life, which is a one-year full-time degree program that is specifically for experienced professionals who are seeking to um, understand the ways that religion intersects with the secular areas of their professional lives. Um, neither, we do not offer institutional grant aid for either the THM or the MRPL programs. That being said, for the MTS and the MDiv programs, we do offer comprehensive institutional grant aid. Um, the vast majority of our funding, um, the first thing is, is that 90% of our students get financial aid in the MTS and MDiv programs. Um, and that it's the, the, we offer a very small pool of merit-based aid based on the strength of an overall application. And then, but the vast majority of our funds are reserved for need-based aid, really for folks uh, really wanting to provide funding to folks who need it the most. Uh, we are offering a financial aid FAQs on Wednesday, and we are also offering a lot of other types of opportunities to connect with us or the Office of Financial Aid if you have further questions. The application for admission for entrance in fall 2024 is now available. So if you are interested in, in, in enrolling here next fall, I encourage you all to start an application if you haven't done so already. Um, it's right on our website. That application deadline is January 4th. And so we encourage folks to make sure they get all their materials in. Um, we are offering um, lots of different events to follow up and find out further information. So I encourage folks to take advantage of that. And finally, please stay connected with us. We have lots of different opportunities still. Um, we are going to be publishing more events and then also uh, um, check us out on our blog, connect with a current student from our Ask Students. Um, we are just so thrilled uh, to be able to connect with prospective applicants and to let them know about what HDS is about. Um, and so that is all I have. I'm going to ask uh, my colleague, Mary Kiesling and all of the panelists, please unmute themselves and turn on their cameras. Um, okay. Um, sorry, I'm just... Thanks so much. Okay, so Mary Keesley, I am going to ask you to take it away. Thank you so much, Margaret. So I'm Mary Keesley. I'm the Associate Director for Career Services, and we really want to spend most of our time talking to the current students because I know that that is who you are really here to hear from. So um, we're just going to kind of kick it off with some basic questions, and then we've also collected some questions from you in advance, which we'll share with our panel. 
Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with um, Jeremy, but this will be the same question for each of the panelists. Um, if you could please share your, your name, your program, um, what you were doing before coming to HDS, and what made you decide to go to graduate school at this point in your life? Say again, I'm supposed to say my name. That's Jeremy Barber. What else am I supposed to say? I failed already straight out the gate. Yes. Uh, which program are you in? I'm in what the Master's you? of Religion and Public Life. What were you doing um, before you arrived and what made you decide to do this? I'm still doing it. Uh, one of the reasons I decided to apply was the Master's in Religion and Public Life was a program when I came to meet with Diane Moore that is crafted in many ways for people who are mid-career uh, and who are working in a practice area where the idea of having time to explore um, how you might use what you do to help facilitate a just world and peace seemed like a really good idea. I am currently engaged in the film and television business. I am commuting while I go to school. So I'm in Cambridge about half the week and back in Los Angeles, the other half. And uh, it's a big bite to chew off, but it's been a hugely uh, important time to sort of reflect on what I do and what my, the Masters in Religion and Public Life is a project-based program. And I was interested in the idea of storytelling and how we can use storytelling in more positive ways to uh, influence the world. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a fully rigorous and academic program, but it's also been amazing to have a moment mid-career to be able to pull back a little bit and look through a different lens at, different ways to imagine how one might use uh, what one does uh, to change the world. Uh, so. Leslie. Sorry, I was muted. Um, Leslie Lawrence, I am a Masters of Divinity uh, candidate. Um, and Last year, I came as a special student part time. Um, just a little worried about biting this off at this stage, um, and living in Cambridge. So I came part time and then applied for the MDiv, and now I'm here um, as a full time student. Um, before I came here, was that the other question? And why did I come here? Um, right before I came here, I was I was I had I had quit my job during the pandemic, um, I was working selling insurance, believe it or not, for my husband. Um, and before that, I was looking, taking care of my kids, doing a lot of volunteer work. And before that, I was um, in HR consulting. Um, and I always wanted to go to divinity school. So uh, I had an opportunity to really change things up um, after the pandemic. Um, after I quit work and and frankly, my, my parents both died. So it was sort of a liminal time in my life where I said, what am I gonna do next? And I decided to pursue the thing that I'd always wanted to do, which is divinity school and really to find a way to be of service. I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Sarah. Hi, thanks. Um, yes, my name is Zara Bot Goins. Um, I'm MDiv candidate 2026. Um, and I, let's see, I um, am coming here um, from a, a background in the nonprofit sector, mostly working on the African continent uh, around um, uh, girls and women's education, um, international development, um, philanthropy, and um, have I think have been driven by service throughout most most of my career, um, and um, decided to um, move in this different direction for a lot of reasons, but um, largely because I couldn't uh, ignore the really loud voice anymore in my in my head. I had been pushing it off, and um, uh, I um, my sense was that I wanted to shift towards more of a, um, um, 
to being of service in a different way um, and really interested in chaplaincy, um, potentially working in prisons, and um, also to just take this time to um, shift a little bit inward and and uh, approach, you know, and potentially go back to nonprofit work in some way as well, but with um, kind of a different lens. Um, yeah. Great. Um, so I'm curious, what have been some of the positive aspects of coming to this program with a little bit more personal and professional experience? Um, and Zara, let's go back to you for this one. Yeah, um, some of the positives. I I think having, um, I have a, a, a graduate degree already and I, you know, I've had, have, have a lot of education under my belt and a lot of experience. And I think what's so wonderful now is, um, so I, I also have two children, one very young, both very young, um, but my time is so precious. And um, I find that I, the classes are so rich to me because of that, um, because that time is so precious. I am fully engaged in a way that um, I probably wouldn't have been uh, 15 years ago. Um, and uh, so I think that piece and what I'm learning and being really present um, in in every aspect. And also um, I think one of the biggest pieces of all of this is um, the, the relationships and the, the connections here and the opportunity to um, be in relationship with just such amazing people. I think those have been the biggest um, positives for sure. Jeremy. I agree with Zara. I mean, I think the thing to me that has been uh, life and world altering is the beautiful mosaic of students who are admitted to the Divinity School. President Gay came to address us and she looked out over the room and, you know, she said, this is what we should all aspire for. And uh, to really be able to enter into partnership and friendship and relationship with people from every corner of the world and every faith practice has been incredibly meaningful. I also wouldn't underestimate just the sheer beauty of the physical campus and plant that is the Divinity School. And as you walk onto that campus, you can't help but feel grounded and at peace. And uh, it just changes your your heart rate and your breathing and you exhale. And uh, so there's something in the earth that's really good there, but I think that the student body is remarkable and makes one feel very hopeful about the future of the world. So that, that for me is what really has stood out. Leslie, how in some ways is it, is it better to come as, a, as someone with a little bit more experience? Yeah, I, I, I just want to echo a little bit of what Jeremy said about um, how special the space is, too, because I think that, um, and I'll get back to coming coming as an older student, but I, I think there is this intentionality around the space at the Divinity School, which allows for a lot of interaction between the students, um, and, and it happens. And it's and it happens very spontaneously, and it's and it's um, for and and I guess as a as an older student where that might not naturally happen because I don't look like all the other students who are between twenty five and thirty five, um, it does, and that's part of the beauty of of the student body. Um, I think as Zara said, the it it feels like such a gift to be at school at this stage. Um, and I think that, well, one thing is I don't hesitate to talk up in class, which um, some of the younger students are a little more shy, so I can get the ball rolling. <laughs> um, there's a slightly different perspective, you know, the difference between the way that we approach um, that the the topic since I was studying religion 35 years ago is is different. And um, so there's a perspective that I can that I can bring that's a little bit different. Um, and I think there's also just a, a relation 
relationality. I don't, I'm not sure that this is even a good word with um, the young, the younger students, sort of a, a perspective that sometimes we, you know, they'll seek me out for my perspective. Um, not everybody, but, you know, sometimes that, that does happen. Um, so it's, you know, from, from my perspective, it's just, it's, it's just, uh, it feels like such a gift to be able to come and dedicate this time to, to study and to have brought, sometimes you can bring things like, oh, you're worried about your money. So let's talk about your, about your financials, you know, your financial planning, um, that some years of experience we can bring to the students. So that's not terribly academic, but it's relationship. But on the other side of this, what have been some unforeseen challenges about being an older student? Leslie, sure. you can pick that up. Um, well, the foreseen ones are, you know, how hard it is to read some of the academic stuff when you haven't been reading it in a long time. But that's exercising a muscle, I think. You know, you you kind of get there. Um, unforeseen challenges. Um, I can jump in if you yeah, like, go Leslie. Yeah. Go, Jeremy, go. I mean, I think one... And again, you figure it out, but everything is on Canvas and online. And that's oh, a yeah. radical change from uh, however, whatever you might have done. Uh, again, I have teenagers and I always wrote their papers and then had them hand them in on Canvas. And now I wish that they had written their papers and I had handed them in on Canvas, but you figure that out. But it is weird uh, to be in such a... Uh, virtual space in terms of all your reading, all of your classes, it can turn out to be helpful. I want to underscore what Leslie said. And yes, your brain will figure it out or it won't, uh, but mostly it will. It is a deeply academic program. Uh, and if somebody thinks they're coming to do something that's more woo-woo or spiritual or divine or devotional or faith-based or, you know, going to Yes, we ground and sit in circle, but if you th think you're coming and you're going to be very kumbaya, this is a deeply academic program that has academic bedrock. It's not that they're not uh, more spiritually open or more creative classes, and you are deeply encouraged to explore, and a lot of the final product can be multimedia, but I have a graduate degree in history from Cambridge, and uh, this program gives that program a full run. So I, I, I would say the thing I was least well prepared for, and I had done a couple of one-week courses at Harvard Divinity School, was the social science academic rigor that underpins uh, this particular uh, training. And uh, I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing, but it is a fact. And I think there are other divinity schools that are more faith-based or ministerial or uh, look at uh, non-scholarly ways into this. And this is very, very scholarly based, which, it, which again, is it, it opens up. I think, Leslie, you would agree. Uh, so I don't know you as well, but, but, you know, it opens up new ways of thinking about stuff, I think, that is useful, but it is a profoundly academic program. Sarah? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I feel like my unforeseen challenges should have been been foreseen by me, but I I think um, you know, foregoing income and and being in the work world uh it is really challenging. And I think I know that there are some of us coming in at this stage who kind of um thought, oh, maybe you can kind of work a little bit and sort of trying to figure out a balance. And to um to uh Jeremy's point, uh this is really hard work and it takes, it's not just hard, um, you know, intellectual work, but spiritual and emotional work. And it takes up a lot of space as it should. Um, so I think being really realistic about that um, um, and making sure that you have the space in your life for that um, is pretty critical. So, I mean, but again, probably something that I could have measured better um, and wouldn't have been as caught off guard by, um, and um, also uh, having a family while doing this is really, really um, challenging. Um, 
and yeah, to that point, making sure that, uh, you know, everybody's on board with, with, with this and it's, it's a, a real, um, beautiful process, but, um, yeah, family, you know, the normal challenges, family, money, life, all of those things that when you, when you come to something and give, you know, give everything over. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard. Leslie. Yeah. I just, you, I wanted to underscore something you said about, um, in the MDiv program, there is, there is some work that we do on discernment. And as Zara has said, that takes up some some space um, that I didn't anticipate that, you know, I as Jeremy said, I expected this to be to be purely academic. But in the MDiv space, because there is a focus on the ministerial part and I wanted that um, there 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 is that. And, and to me, some of that challenge is how do I talk about that when I when I'm home? Um, Jeremy, do you have to leave? I, I shifted my schedule around, so I have a little more time. Thank okay, you. Okay, perfect. Great. So, um, this is a, a non-binding question, so no pressure, but, um, what are you hoping to do with your HDS degree after graduating? I'd love to hear each of you speak on that. Uh, I can kick off. I'm hoping to get my HDS degree and graduate. That's front of mind before I get to the point of what I'm going to do after it. Uh, and again, because I've made the unusual decision, which I spoke to someone who had done before me who had commuted from Chicago. Uh, I am commuting to Los Angeles every week and have three teenagers, one who's just started college and still working full time. Uh, there are not enough minutes in the day. So, uh, you know, at this point, I'm very focused. But again, for those of you who are considering the master's in religion and public life. And when I sat with Diane, I said, I'm not sure this is for me. And she said, no, no, this is exactly for you. If you told me you wanted to go to the library and spend three years doing a deep dive and studying and getting a PhD, this wouldn't be for you. Uh, I think I am testing the outer limits of what's possible in the marriage of being a professional who is looking to amplify or deepen what he or she does. Uh, you know, my goal was very simple. I sit in a pretty unique place in my business and in my community. And I wanted to have new tools, new ideas, new assets, new allies. I wanted to have more uh, bows in my quiver. I always get confused which way you're supposed to say that. I think I'm adding bows to my quiver. Uh, and I wanted to see if I could amplify my ability to make positive change in my community and my job while I had it. I also think probably in the back of my mind, I saw this as a magic portal and that if I weren't able to use it uh, to full effect to mid-career sort of give deeper meaning and resonance to what I do, that maybe it would provide, if not off ramps, uh, opportunities that would provide fulfillment in other ways. So I very much had a dual purpose. Uh, but, you know, I came very much with the idea of taking uh, the cudgel I have and making it bigger and stronger and that if I could do that, it would make what I do more meaningful and more interesting and give it greater weight and impact. So. I can go. Um, I came here wanting to um, go into chaplaincy in a multi-faith space. Um, as Zara said at the beginning, I I definitely have had this sort of calling to go to divinity school for reasons I don't really get. And all the lovely adm admissions people at the various divinity schools said, you don't have to know exactly what you're coming for. That's okay. But, um, and everybody talks about how what you come in wanting to do may not be what you end up going out doing. And that's also a good thing because that's about the discernment. Um, I'm still wanting to go into uh, multi-faith chaplaincy for people who who are not within um, a, uh, a, a an organized religion. Um, so my my position or my feeling is that they, we all have spiritual needs, but we don't all have uh, people who can that we can call upon for um, when we need them, when we're sick, when we're dying, when 
you know, when we're getting married, when whatever those those events are in life. Um, and also just to to kind of bring the conversation about spiritual fulfillment to people who are not engaged with a with a with a practice or with a faith, um, bring that conversation to those people. Um, and uh, just quickly, uh, I think I came here also um, looking for a total kind of vocational shift towards chaplaincy, as I mentioned earlier, earlier um, looking at um, chaplaincy in prisons um, and uh, and also kind of potential um, ordination, um, maybe in the, uh, the Episcopal Church, but exploring all of that still, which is, again, part of the hard work is, um, yeah um having all of those conversations and feeling all of those things and exploring yeah. okay i'm going to turn to a practical question that was submitted in advance of the session um so if you've been away from school for a while it can be hard to know who to turn to for an academic recommendation can you talk a little bit about how you went about pulling your recommendations together um, I, I was advised to go to somebody I work who had, who I'd worked with. Um, I had, uh, somebody, I'd, so somebody I had really had been my boss. Um, I had somebody who I had done a lot of volunteer work so they could also talk to sort of my managerial or that kind of skills. Um, and then I had a friend. Um, so I think in in lieu of um of school because i hadn't been in school for 30 years that the the boss fulfilled that um role i can go it's a great question and five years ago i got halfway through an application uh before there was the masters in religion and public life and again, I think what you hear is people who come have a strong tug to come, whether it's a calling or something else. And at some point you just have no choice, it seems, and then you come. Uh, but I couldn't figure out who my references would be. And then, you know, five years later, I'm on the board of Georgetown Law School where I had gone. And the dean of the law school was someone who goes both be an academic reference and speak to my role in leadership. I was on the board of a homeless organization and the guy who ran the homeless organization was excited and happy to write in. In the one week program I did, I became very close friends uh, with a minister from Georgia. So all of a sudden, again, you know, things happen when you're ready. Uh, my three references were just right out in front of me, but literally I stopped my application process. I think I came on the visiting day and I can't remember if I said in markets off someone else. I'm like, who are my references? And they're like, just get anybody. And I'm like, that doesn't help. What do you mean? Just get anybody. Uh, I do think that the Divinity School understands that there are a group of people there who range from, you know, 40 to 70 and that while well, you have to dust off transcripts and get all kinds of vaccinations and make sure that stuff you had when you were 12, you still have immunity to. I mean, it's a bummer, but they do understand that they're working with people who are in later life. And I found that the uh, the Divinity School is very, very supportive in helping me make sense of an application process that wasn't maybe tailored to somebody who was 25 years into a career and 30 years away from being an undergraduate is what I would say. Yeah, I think that's it. I don't, I, yeah, just some creativity there and yet really leaning on, um, um, colleagues and, and, and bosses and people in the work world as well, um, who can speak to your leadership and yeah. Great. So there's another very practical question that is on the mind of, I think there were six different questions that were asked in different ways about how do I do this financially? And I'm used to having an income and this feels like a big risk. Um, how do I plan financially for time away from work? Um, and, you know, th potentially pivoting to a different career. This all feels a little financially precarious. I would just say really quickly, it just is, 
risky and scary. And like, I'm, I know there's planning that can be done, but there is a little bit of a leap of faith that the <laughs> sounds so, I mean, but the path sort of lighting itself, that's not practical. I mean, uh, I, for, for me, um, uh, exploring um, how to do remote work and work on very specific projects so that I can still be doing some work um, is one aspect of it. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the school has been really wonderful about you know, helping us navigate different resources that are here. Um, Massachusetts is really good at um, uh, supports um, in the community, whether it's, um, you know, if you have kids, or if you, there's just, there's a lot of um, kind of social, what um, social supports um, to help supplement some things, um, but there just is no, it's not going to be comfortable. I guess I, I maybe, I think for some people it is. Um, and, uh, and I would just say, I'm, you know, personally it is not, and it's been hard and that's the hardest part. Um, and I wouldn't change it for anything and I would keep doing it and I would make the same decision over again. So it's, um, it's sort of a, a little bit of a mental shift, um, that there will be a little bit of foregoing of the same kind of lifestyle income, um, again, not for me, but to be ready for that and comfortable with that kind of going in with that mindset. Not a fun answer. Sorry. Jeremy. Well, I'm the bad example, right? Because I split the baby. I'm still working full time, which I think, let me put it this way. And some of my friends, you know, last night I was in Los Angeles and my friend who's a Swami made a beautiful dinner and had a Hindu festival and there was multi-faith preaching. I'm like, I can't say fuck. I was like, damn. Um, I'm missing out on that amazing experience. And I am. There's just no way to slice it. But again, I came to a program that was at least pitched to me as my value is that I'm a professional. Um, and so I have the benefit that Zara doesn't of I have my income. Uh, I have the detriment of I miss out on a lot of stuff that I really wish I could. I look at it more like what a privilege that I've been able to squeeze this in my life. And I've given myself the sampler size or the appetizer and maybe the full meal will come later, but, and the reward has been tremendous in terms of just shifting the way you think and broadening your horizons. But there are programs, including the one I'm in that are tailored to professionals and where they recruit, at least they seem to recruit people who while you can be in residence, also continue with their careers. I do know a lot of people have tried this and shifted into the longer programs or given up their day jobs or tailored uh, what they're doing. I think, as I said, with sort of making it project-based or more online, uh, but certainly with the Masters in Religion and Public Life, it really is, you know, October, November, it's uh, September, October, November, it's February, March, April, you can pretty much figure out six months if you're crazy enough to try to do it. Uh, and you will get a smattering of good stuff, but you will keep some of your economic anxiety and you will keep your foot in the other world too. So. I, I think I'm also not a, a great example. Um, just because I, I have a family that supports me doing this. And, um, it, you know, so the, the financial part is, is more like, um, I guess our, our, our shift. <laughs> My husband has to take care of the house now, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Um, but, but it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a shift that we take as a family for, I, I just felt really strongly. I've got adult children and it was my time. And, um, so this is my time in our family to fulfill something that I've wanted, that I've literally been talking about for 30 years. And as Jeremy said, the, the poll, you can't ignore the poll after a while. And, um, so here, here I am. And, there are sacrifices, but um, but you can't ignore it. Mary, I have to go in a couple of minutes. If there's any question that you think is specific or that because of 
how I'm doing it, I, I'm uniquely able to answer. Otherwise, I'm going to leave you in the very capable hands of Zara and Leslie. Thank you, Jeremy. We're really glad that you gave us the time that, that you could. And um, it was it was super helpful to have your perspective. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so this is a little bit less practical and a little more emotional. Um, a question came through, uh, what were your fears and concerns as you started this program or you were a prospective student and imagining yourself here? Um, I'll jump in. I I think I didn't, I, I um, maybe with delusions, I didn't, and I would never had um, any visions of problems with sort of the, um, the work and, and, you know, my, my confidence in um, getting through the program in that way. But it, it, I think I, on the other side of the coin, um, had a fear of, um, can I finish this? And I think too, the um, points that I said earlier around all of the other pressures of life. And so, um, is that what you're asking? Sorry, like what were the the fears? Fears and concerns was the question, yeah. Yeah, it's just like, you know, um, uh, because of my situation, um, having to really break down all of the, um, like really break it down and figure out, okay, these are the semesters and um, uh, and try to find a way. Um, uh, th those were my fears. All of the rest of it, I just um, assumed it's going to be great. And it has been so, and that remains the case. Uh, my fear was, was literally like, can I get the reading done? And can I write a paper? They were, it was really, um, and, and can I be away from my family? Um, for, for this amount of time. So th those have been my fears. Um, you know, the papers to begin with are really hard, but, but for me, they have been, um, but it's a muscle. I just, I think it's a, I think it's a muscle you got to exercise and, um, and it's worthwhile to, I, if you want it badly enough, you're going to, you're going to, you know, you're going to run the marathon. So that's kind of been my perspective. I did start as a special student um, part with with a part-time schedule because I was that afraid. <laughs> if that makes sense, yeah. So I, I, I think it's those two things, like like the academics and um being away from my family were the were the two things that my my kids are grown up, but you know, they're in their early 20s. You still worry. I still worry about them. Let me just also add to that. And Leslie, I hear you on that. Um, and, but I, I think there's the, that family piece. And I think probably a lot of people coming in at that, you know, at this stage um, in life, uh, for me, it's kind of this, I, I, I know I was concerned about what other people thought about what I was doing, because it's a little bit outside of the box of what the people in my kind of universe are interested in or understand or, or kind of like. Um, and so um, fears of um, having to explain myself and having to, you know, and, and not having the support to do this, those kinds of fears, I think. And, you know, luckily the, the, the other voice stays really loud and the, it sort of drowns out all of that, but, you know, it, it still, it still peaks its, its head up from time to time. Yeah, I will say on that point, I found it very interesting to see the people who are totally get it are not always the ones that I would that I expected would totally get it. Um and 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 that keeps get that that keeps the that other doubt a little bit further away that like oh, people are going to think I'm really weird. <laughs> there are enough people that get it and when they do it's like ah oh. Yay, we can talk about this stuff. And it's so nourishing that it makes it all really worthwhile. Okay, I'm going back to the practical side of things. Um, I know that there'll be other sessions that will specifically address housing, but I think as mid-career um, students, housing can 
be a little bit different when you're thinking about how to find housing in Boston and something that will work for you at this stage in life. Can you say a little bit about how you navigated the Boston housing market, um, how you found the the prices to be, you know, where you kind of found yourself? Um, I So last year when I was a part-time student, I lived with us with my sister. So that made it really easy. Um, this year I got an apartment. And what I will tell you that it really surprised me, I haven't lived alone for 30 years. And I thought, okay, I'm grown up. I want to live alone. Um, and I think I don't want to live alone. And it, it's been a really interesting um, discovery for me that um, I should probably have roommates and who knew, like, like it was like this boy, you know, like I've lived with people for all this time. I'm going to get to live by myself. It's been different. The, the price is, you know, it's, it, it's expensive. I think there are options, how close you are to, uh, it, how, you know, where are you? Are you in Cambridge? I know people who live in Waltham or people who live, um, in Arlington or, you know, in, in places where they can get a, it, when they really do want to live by themselves, um, a, a less expensive, um, setup. I know people who've gone into Harvard housing, which apparently is very tricky. Even one guy who's, um, I don't, he's in his late sixties and he's living in a dorm. Um, so there's a lot of options. I've known people who've, who've, uh, gotten roommates. Um, there's a lot of also uh, communal housing in Cambridge. It can be a long process to get into communal housing, but people love co or, or cooperative housing. People love cooperative housing. Um, so I think there's a lot of options that can be explored and some of the student groups um, help with that. So it's, you know, it's, it's another kind of dig deep and figure out what it is that that you want as a as an individual. And I I got it wrong this year, I think. <laughs> um, I I am in graduate housing, um, and I actually had a good experience with that process. Um, so I'm in a um a graduate housing that has just a lot of families and a lot of older um students, so that that helps and um and it's wonderful and it's right by the river and fairly close to school and so that's been a, an okay process and and easier i mean i moved from new york and um the prices are absurd there they're absurd here but as leslie said i mean there's lots of different ways to make this work and i think we both know um lots of people who have are figuring all, all kinds of different ways to approach this out and i um in the process leading up to um moving um, there was so much support from the school and around resources and um, kind of directions to navigate, you know, where to go and um, where to look. And um, yeah, I think that, um, uh, but I, I would definitely advocate for um, graduate housing. Uh, it's uh, the, the, the lottery period um, can be stressful, but once you've gotten through all of that, it, it, um, if you get lucky, it's, it's all good. Um, another practical question has come up in the chat. Um, how did you figure out what to do for your writing sample? Sort of related to the, you know, what do I want to do for references since I've been out of school for so long? Writing sample. I I I did a lot of um I did a lot of writing classes when I was a stay-at-home mom. And actually even when I was when I was working. Um, and I used one of those writing pieces. I, I think I think somebody said this when I was um, watching one of these panels. Like Harvard just wants to know that you can write, not that you can write academically. Um, there's a lot of, um, and, and that was sort of the advice that I got. Like that you that you can. Th there's a lot of flexibility here to not in all classes, but in a number of classes to do more creative um, responses to the to the work. 
Um, so it's, it's really more about knowing that you can write, not that you can write an academic paper, if that makes sense. So mine was a creative piece, sort of memoir-ish. I think um, I I um, I had a, a thesis from a prior graduate degree that I just draw upon, uh, drew upon, upon, and um, I really focused my time on the um, uh, the other writing. Um, the what am I? Why am I missing the name? The personal other, statement. Personal statement. I spent a lot of. I spent probably just a year mulling over thinking about really pouring my heart and soul into that piece um be, but I was lucky there that I had this it was from about 10 years ago but I did have a, an academic piece of writing to to draw from now we're getting toward the end here and um I I think I'd like to just ask you knowing who is in the audience right now what what would you like to share with people who are trying to decide whether to pursue this as a mid-career uh, student? Listen to your heart. I don't think this is a practical decision. I think it's a I think it's a heartfelt decision. And um yeah, I think I think um I think if 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 you've got that tugs and don't ignore it. Yeah, I think that's that's it. And um uh and I I think it's really important to you know have one or two people in your <clears throat> support network that are 100% supporting what you're doing. That feels really important to me knowing now many things. And I think even if it's just one person in your corner about this decision to really lean on that person um, and, or people um, and really, really listen to, um, cause yeah, it's, it's not particularly practical and everything doesn't need to be um, practical. Uh, that doesn't serve uh, the world. Um, we, what would we do without people who are making these kinds of decisions to go inward and then outward um, with service? So um, it's it's a, a both a um, um, it can appear a selfish move. Um, I find it to be one of the most selfless and important decisions. And um, yeah, I think that's just um, you know to to uh to allow for the um for your imagination and your heart and creativity and what could be to really um be uh to to win the day i think we could all be better served doing um, more of that uh in the world so yeah Well, thank you, Zara. Thank you, Leslie. I'm going to bring Margaret back in here for the closing remarks. And we are so grateful for your time. I know this is a particularly stressful time of the semester, and uh, we're very appreciative. Yes. Well, thank you to you, Mary. And thanks to Zara and Leslie for your time and for your, your perspectives. I know we didn't get to everything in the chat or in the q and I'm sure there are folks that have other questions. Um, we are offering further events. Um, please always just feel free to email us as well at admissions at hds.harvard.edu. I just want to say again, thank you all so much for joining us. We hope this was helpful to you um, and we hope you have a great uh, rest of your evening. Bye-bye.